All right, so today we're going to do some work in chapter four, finish chapter four. Next week, I believe, is our first exam, right? That's coming up. So on Thursday, one of the things that we will do is collectively decide on what days, evenings, I will have the review sessions for you all. So please, uh, between now and Thursday, review your schedules for, uh, for that so that we can come up with, a, as best we can, a mutually usable time. Uh, of course, there is no such thing as a perfect time, but we'll make the best of it. Okay? So we're going to start off today by building some models as we have been so far, but I want to draw a few things on the board first. So let's, let's take the first five hydrocarbons that we've learned about, right? What would the first one be, the one carbon one? What would the name of that one be? CH4 would be what? Methane. And then we would have CH3, CH3, and this one would be ethane. Yeah, two is F, ethane. Then we would have three carbons, which would be propane. And then we would have four carbons, which would be butane. And then I'm running out of space, so maybe I can... Which would be what? Pentane. Pentane. Now, I wrote them out in what kind of formula? Um, condensed. This is kind of a condensed formula, right? It's not the bond line drawing, right? Kind of hard to draw the bond line drawing for methane, just being one carbon, right? But we can draw ethane, we can draw <laughs> propane. We can draw butane much quicker, can't we? Right? And we can, of course, draw pentane, which looks like a back flying, right? So those are the first five hydrocarbons that we've learned about. And we all call these straight chain hydrocarbons because as I'm drawing out the, except for that one being a little slanted, right? We kind of draw them out in a, as, a, as if they were straight. But in fact, they're not straight, right? We start to zig and they start to zag, and we start to build um, models of the alkanes. Okay, These are pure hydrocarbons. They're alkanes. They're all single bonds. The hybridization of every carbon atom is what? What's the hybridization of all those carbon atoms? Do they have any double bonds? So it must be sp3. They're all sp3 hybridized carbon atoms, right? We have methane. What kind of carbon is that? Is that a primary, secondary, or tertiary carbon? How many carbons is it bound to? One, so it is a? Primary. primary. What about that one? Secondary. What about that one? Secondary. Yeah, we don't have any tertiary. We haven't started to branch and do anything yet, right? So, so far we're only dealing with primary and secondary carbons, which means we're only dealing with primary and secondary hydrogens. Right? So we learned, we learned a little bit about that, right? Now, as we start to build models, right, what, was this, what would this be? This would be CH4. This would be methane, right? Is this a solid, liquid, or a gas? It is a gas, right? It's a, it's a gas, right? We know that because this is natural gas, right? You go turn on your gas stove at home, so this is a gas. At room temperature. And I add, and then I'm going to be talking about all these at room temperature, okay? So I add another carbon, and now I have ethane, right? It hasn't started to zig or zag yet, right? Is this a solid, liquid, or a gas? It too is a gas. And I'm going to add 
another carbon, right? And you all should know about propane if you like to grill or your parents like to grill, right? Your propane grill, right? There's propane. What state is it at room temperature? Yes. It's a gas. Right? We're just going off of our common knowledge here. So I'm going to add another carbon. Oh, there's one. And now I'm starting to get some zigging and zagging, right? This is butane. You probably come into contact with this if you ever used a butane lighter. Is it a solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature and at, at, at atmospheric pressure? It's a gas, right? You push on the butane lighter, gas comes out, right? Now you might say, well, if I look at the butane lighter like the cheap little big ones that you can see through, there's a liquid in there. Well, it's at high pressure, so it forces it to be a liquid. But it's starting to get to be a liquid. This is starting to be an easier liquid than propane. In fact, if you pick up your dad's propane bottle on his gas grill and you shake it, you'll hear liquid sloshing around. Well, it's a liquid because it's under pressure. Okay? But if you had ethane or methane in those containers, they would still be gases. So the physical properties are clearly changing as we keep adding carbons. Now let's add one more carbon. Let's add one more carbon. And now we've got pentane, right? You can see how that looks like the little bat. There's the wings, right? What do you think about that one? Is it a solid liquid or a gas? at room temperature. If you were to come up to my lab, would I give you a cylinder, a gas cylinder of pentane, or would I give you a bottle of liquid propane, or liquid pentane? This one is a liquid. It's a low boiling liquid. You can take pentane, you can put it in your hand, and you can almost get it to boil. Okay, Somewhere in the upper 30s is its boiling point. Okay, But nonetheless, it is a liquid at room temperature. What's changing as we go from left to right in all of these? <coughs> the number of carbons in the chain is certainly changing. So what? The number of hydrogens change. Number of hydrogens change? Okay. Molecular the molecular weight certainly changes, Physical right? Properties. Physical properties are changing, obviously. The yeah. State of Pardon? The state, of the state of matter is changing, right? We're going from gases to liquids, and if we keep going up in number of carbons, at some point we'll have something that is kind of solid. Think of greases, right? Those are solids at room temperature, but they're, they got long chains, right? We could go all the way out, but we're not going to. Okay. What else is changing? Shape. Shape, the number of ways in which this can rotate. We're certainly starting to change, right? I mean, methane can only do this, right? But when I have ethane, now I can have rotation around a bond. And when I add propane, now I've got rotation around more than one bond. And I've got all kinds of rotation that can go on with pentane, right? What else is changing? I think somebody said it, but size is changing. Size matters. The longer, the bigger the molecule will have an impact on its physical properties. So. You've made a molecule of, of pentane. I've made a molecule of pentane. And what you can see is if these things start to come together, there's a lot of touch points. There's a lot of surface area for these molecules to interact with each other. This is called van der Waals interactions. You learned about that in general chemistry. Everything has van der Waals interactions, but it's the tendency for, for molecules to interact with themselves. Okay. What do you think happens if we start to move some of these atoms around and we start to, I don't know, maybe do something like this. Make an isomer of pentane. I've just moved the atoms around, right? But now I have this. And what you'll see is that this is the same molecular formula, right? You all agree with that? I didn't take anything off. I just moved things around. Right, how would we name that? What's the parent? Is it still pentane? What's the longest chain? Three is the longest chain, right? So this is now something propane, right? But it has the same number of carbons and hydrogens as pentane. 
So they are isomers of one another. They are constitutional isomers. They're connected differently, right? So this is 2,2-dimethyl propane. Now if I'm going to compare 2,2-dimethyl propane to itself, can you make 2,2-dimethyl propane for me? Take the two methyl groups off of the end. That'll work. Now, when we were talking about pentane, when I brought the two pentane molecules together, we said there was a lot of surface area for them to touch, right? What's going to happen now? Is there a lot of surface area for them to touch? So, are these going to have stronger or weaker Van der Waals interactions? Weaker. So what do you think is going to happen to the warming point? Is it going to go up or is it going to go down? It's going to go down. This will boil. Um, this one will boil at a much lower temperature than pentane. Okay. However, they weigh exactly the same. They have exactly the same number of carbons and hydrogen. But this one will have a different boiling point. Than this one. I haven't changed carbons, I haven't changed hydrogens. If I went to my magic balance that could weigh this one molecule, you would find that it has exactly the same mass as the other one. As that one, yeah. But yet the physical properties are going to be different, right? What's the take home message here? Structure matters. How things are connected matters. Okay? Very, very important. Okay? So that's alkanes. And what you'll notice, right, is I've got a lot of rotation. What do we call that when we can rotate around single bonds? What is this versus this? Those are conformations, right? And we know that we can look at conformations by looking at what kind of projections? Newman. Newman projections. And we know that the big group on one atom of the Newman projection and the big group on the other atom of the Newman projection want to be as far apart as they possibly can, right? That is more stable than that because now you can start to see that wanting to run into the other group, right? Things don't like to crowd each other. It's physically <coughs> impossible to put two things in the same space. Right? So crowding things becomes an issue. Now we also learned last time that we can have these little gray pieces. Right? And what do we call these? These are double bonds. But when I have a carbon-carbon double bond, what is this? What's, what's the functional group? It is a pi bond. You're right. These are alkenes. Okay? So alkanes or all of these things, but when we start to have double bonds, we start to have alkenes. Now, as you might imagine, I can stick an alkene on something that's also got just normal sp3 hybridized carbons. What are the, what's the hybridization of the carbon atoms of an alkene? It's sp2. And while I can rotate around this alkane portion, if you will, I can't do that to the alkene portion. Right? I just physically can't do it. Won't let me do it. Okay? So, since we know that structure matters, I can have a molecule that looks like this. And if I think about the plane of the pi bond, my methyl groups, if you will, are on opposite sides. Kind of looks like a Newman projection, right? Do you think that's going to be more stable or less stable than if I do this? That one is more stable than this one, right? Why? Yeah, we're starting to get things close together. And look, I can't rotate it out of the way, right? It's going to force these two things together, right? And we're going to learn how to name these today a little bit. We started talking about that last time. Remember last time we called this cis? These two groups are cis to one another. Here they are trans to one another, right? Cis and trans. And 
We learned that also in naming cycloalkanes, and we learned that cis and trans doesn't always mean more stable, right? We learned that cis 1,2 versus cis 1,3 in a cycloalkane depends on how, how it is, you know, whether it adopts a chair confirmation, all this kind of stuff, right? And so we learned that last time, okay? So, let's talk a little bit more about alkenes today and alkynes. What would an alkyne be? Triple bond. And what part do you have that can do that? Conveniently, you have this piece. It's a linear piece with, with looks like a paddle, okay? This is a pi bond. This is a pi bond. So you have alkyne pieces, you have alkene pieces, and of course you have a bunch of stuff for alkanes as well. Okay? So we just talked about this, right? Uh, that we can have cis 2 butene, we just made that, and we can have trans 2 butene, which is what I've got here, right? Notice how the cis and trans are written. You write cis and trans kind of as italics, okay? Now, on an exam, am I going to make you perfectly right in italics? No. Just don't capitalize the whole thing, okay? Notice it's small case. So you have cis-butene, you have trans-2-butene. These cannot be interconverted by simple rotation because of that pi bond. It restricts the rotation. This is a special class of isomer called diastereomer. These are not conformational isomers by rotation. These are diastereomers. Okay. You okay? Good. Okay. These are diastereomers. They have the same molecular formula. They have the same functional group. The alkene is the functional group here. But they are not the same. Right? So if I build another one. pieces here. We'll make the cis and we'll make the trans. Got the trans, let's make the cis. I think you all can clearly look at those and tell that those aren't the same shape. Right? Do you think they're going to have the same boiling points? They are not. They will have different boiling points. One will be lower boiling point than the other. We'll learn a little bit about that later on. You'll learn about that in the lab. Okay? They have different physical properties, but they have the same function group. They both have an alkene. They have the function group located in exactly the same location, uh, but the two groups are on the same side of the plane. Here they're on opposite sides of the plane. Okay? And so, again, structure matters a whole lot in terms of how these molecules are going to behave. Okay? And we just argued that the cis isomer of an alkene is going to be the less stable isomer. For those of you in um, the nutrition world, you all eat fatty acids. Fatty acids have alkenes in them. They're liquids at room temperature. Okay. Do you want those alkenes to be cis or trans? Do you know? What kind of fats are bad for you? Trans fats, exactly, right? Biologically, we want to have our fats to have this kind of carbon-carbon double bond, where the two groups are on the same side. They stay liquid at room temperature. What do you think happens to the trans? It's become solids. Yeah, or they, they will become solid at a different temperature, right? And it turns out, the best that we can tell, that's the reason why they're bad for Turns out all the oxidation chemistry is exactly the same. But that's for a different class. Okay? That we won't go into. But nonetheless, right? Olive oil, lard. Okay? Olive oil, lard. So you can think of it that way. Okay? And it turns out that nature wants your fats to be in the less stable conformation because they're, they appear to, be, to, to remain liquid and uh, provide the products that you want. Now, one of the things that this model doesn't do a good job of, it doesn't really show you the orbitals very well. Okay? This is what the orbitals look like in an alkene. Okay? So each carbon is sp2 hybridized. 
That means that this bond, this sigma bond, this sigma bond, and the sigma bond between the two carbon atoms, which isn't shown in your model, by the way, there is no sigma bond that you can see here, are all made by the overlap of sp2 hybridized orbitals. Well, I know that a carbon atom comes in with an s orbital and three p orbitals, so if I take an s orbital and two p orbitals to make my sp2 hybrids, that means that I've got a p orbital that's left alone on each carbon atom. And that p orbital, right, is a both above and below the plane of the carbon-carbon bond here. Okay, so that's what they're trying to show with this gray area. That's the plane of the two carbons, right? These two points have to align the same plane. And so you've got one lobe of the p orbital on top, the upper, other lobe of the p orbital on bottom, and same thing on the other carbon, okay? And these things get close to one another and they form a pi bond. The pi bond actually happens both at the top and at the bottom. That's what this is trying to model for you, is the pi bond. So think of this top one as the blue lobes overlapping and the bottom one as the red lobes overlapping, okay? They are colored differently because of the wave equation that we're not gonna talk about, okay? They're mathematical signs to the solutions of the Schrodinger equation, okay? And it, it hurts your head to think about things in waves and stuff, but that, that's, how, that's how electrons work, okay? But we don't need to know that to understand how to make this uh, useful for us, okay? So do you suppose that that pi bond is stronger or weaker than a sigma bond? So here I've got a sigma bond. Is that bond stronger or weaker than this pi bond? The sigma bond? Why do you say that? Well, I can rotate it. There's no doubt about that. But does that imply strength? It is stronger. Why is it? Why is the sigma bond stronger than the pi bond? Because it has more energy. Oh, the distance in between. Close. It does have to do with energy. It does have to do with distance. But if you think about it, these two p orbitals are sitting kind of like this. The best model I've ever figured out is my fingers. Okay? So they just touch on the sides. They barely overlap. Right? You can still see in the shape. Right? This is still a lobe that's just kind of touching barely between the two. But the sigma bond, those orbitals overlapped completely. Yes, I can rotate around them, but they're completely overlapped. And the overlap of orbitals is what gives the strength of a bond. So it turns out that pi bonds are considerably weaker than sigma bonds. And so, when you think about the chemistry of alkenes, you're almost always going to be breaking that weak pi bond. Okay? Pi bonds are weak, sigma bonds are strong. Okay? So, let's think of a simple reaction. You don't need to understand the reaction yet in terms of what's happening, but we'll talk more about that later. But let's, let's go ahead and introduce a simple reaction. One of the things that companies will do is they will take fats, okay, so there's some pi bonds connected together and we got whatever out here and we've got whatever out here, I don't, it doesn't really matter, okay, and vegetable oils, are they solids, liquids, or gases at room temperature? They're liquids, but wait a second, I could go into the grocery store and I could buy all vegetable shortening, which is a what? Solid liquid. It's a solid. So how in the world do they take vegetable oil, which is a liquid, and make it into a solid? Well, they could freeze it, but it's sitting on the shelf, <laughs> right? So obviously that's not it. Pardon? Technically, they could. That would take a lot of pressure. It takes a lot of pressure to convert a liquid into a solid. And we know we can open the can, right, and just dip this stuff out. So that's probably not good. Good try, though. Dehydrated? 
Dehydrate. I don't have any water to remove. Dehydration means the removal of water. There's no water to remove here. Change the structure. I can change the structure through a reaction. That's right. Have you all ever heard of partially hydrogenated oils? That's what they're going to do. They take this and they actually add hydrogen to it. Okay? They use a catalyst. Let's not worry about what that is. And they use hydrogen gas. And it turns out that alkenes can be converted to alkanes by simply adding hydrogen to the molecule. We'll learn more about that later. And so maybe it leaves that one alone and the two hydrogens get added here. Okay? And so as we start to add more and more hydrogen, it starts to be more and more like an alkane. It starts to have more Van der Waals interactions that allow it to solidify. Okay? Do you think this reaction lies to the right or to the left if it's an equilibrium reaction? And all reactions are equilibrium reactions, by the way. To the right. Why do you think that? It stays solid. It stays solid, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to use our common sense here. We go, we buy veg partially hydrogenated vegetable oil as vegetable shortening. We go home, and unless you throw it in a hot pan, it just doesn't all spontaneously turn into a liquid and you ruin, ruin it, right? So we just learned that pi bonds are weak and that sigma bonds are strong. What does it mean to be a strong bond? High in energy or low in energy? Low. Low. It means it's very stable. It means it's low in energy, right? So what am I sacrificing? I am sacrificing a very weak pi bond, but I'm gaining two strong sigma bonds. So the equilibrium is going to lie to the Right. That is a fundamental concept of chemistry that you need to know. The equilibrium will always favor the more stable side of the equation. It always does. Nature wants to be lazy. It doesn't want to maintain a high energy state. It wants to maintain a low energy state. And so what we can do is we can take our vegetable oils, we can partially hydrogenate them, get rid of that weak pi bond, or some of those weak pi bonds, and replace it with strong sigma bonds. And we end up with shortening. Non-animal derived shortening. Yeah. Would you mind repeating that statement? You made uh, equilibrium will always favor what? More stable. It always favors the more stable side of the equation. Yeah. Now, you will get into some classes where they, you, know, you probably did this in Gen Chem a little bit, where they ask you to calculate the value of something. I can look at that. I don't need to calculate the value at all. I know it's going to lie to the right. It's one of the things I love about organic chemistry. I get to use government numbers. I get to use concepts. I don't have to actually get out to four or five decimal places of accuracy. That's what my physical chemist colleagues do. And bless them for it. It drives me crazy. But I can look at that equation and I know which side of the equation the reaction is going to lie on. Okay. If you read in the syllabus, this is the chemical common sense part that I'm trying to give you before you get to biochem. Because when you get to biochem, you're going to look at all of these pathways, and they're going to be all confusing, unless you can break it down into the fundamentals. Is the product more stable or less stable than the reactant? If the product is more stable, the reaction goes to the right. If it is not, it lies to the left. Okay? You're going to figure these things out, but this is part of that chemical common sense that we're trying to, to instill in you, okay? So, what did we just learn? We learned that pi bonds are weak. We learned that sigma bonds are strong. We learned that uh, physical properties are dependent on the shape and structure of a molecule, right? So those are the things that you need to commit to memory, okay? Here's some examples. Nature is full of examples of alkenes, okay? Nature is full of examples of alkenes. So, carrots. The orange color comes from this pigment called beta carotene. What do you see? You see a lot of alkenes, right? Are carrots good for us? They sure are, and why are they? What part do they help us with? Eyesight, right? Why? Anybody know? Pardon? Okay, it is vitamin A, but what about it? Anybody know? 
I'm not expecting you to know. It's okay. I'm just trying to see if anybody knows. It turns out that beta carotene gets cut in half to produce vitamin A. Vitamin A then gets converted into a different molecule that your eyesight needs or your eyes need to see anything. Okay, and that has to constantly be replenished. Okay, uh, and we'll you'll learn about that later on uh, in maybe in biochem. Okay, for those of you who like ginger, that gingery smell comes from this oil of ginger. This is what it looks like. But again, alkenes, right? Notice that it is very different than beta carotene, right? Beta carotene. What color is this? It's orange, right? This one, mm, not colored, okay? If you like citrusy fruits, things like oranges and lemons, you have this molecule called limonene. Now there's this, this little weird thing going on here. This is S-limonene and this is R-limonene. We're gonna learn about that in chapter six, so don't worry about it now. But don't those look like the same molecule? They do look like the same molecule, except if you both, if one person builds a model of the S limonene and somebody builds a model of the R limonene, you will see that you can't take them and actually overlay them on top of one another. Groups will not be pointing in the same directions in space. It's a different kind of isomer called enantiomers, and we'll be learning about that in chapter six, I believe. Okay? All right, but next time you go to the fresh or wherever and you get an orange and you peel it, Take, the, take a little bit of the peel and hold it pretty close to your eye and squeeze it. You'll see a pop. And you'll see this stuff come out. It'll start to smell citrusy. That stuff that's coming out is limonene. It is that molecule. Okay? And in fact, it's flammable. And what, we know it's flammable. It's a hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbons burn. You can take an orange peel and you can squeeze it and squirt that juice out into like a candle and it will, it'll, it'll flame up. Okay? Uh, and it's because it's a pure hydrocarbon. And then this is alpha farnesine, again an alkene. Uh, this is that waxy coating that is on apples, right? And so why do apples produce a waxy coating? To protect themselves from insects, right? So uh, it's, a, it's a coating. Oh, and by the way, limonene is actually a very potent natural ant killer. So if you are an organic person who likes to get stuff that's organic to put out to control pests and bugs, Chances are the bug killer that you're using is limonene, okay? And they harvest it from a variety of sources, from leftover peels and all that kind of stuff. Put it in a bottle uh, and you can spray it on ants and it's one of the quickest things to kill um, fire ants that there is. It's actually uh, limonene. Kills them dead, but yet it doesn't hurt us. You all eat it all the time. If you, if you like cakes that have orange zest in it, what's orange zest? It's the shavings of the peel, right? And they put it in a cake, stir it up, bake it, tastes great, you don't die, right? Uh, limonene is not that toxic to us. Could we eat enough of it to kill us? Absolutely, but your belly would get full before that happens, so you're in, you're in good shape, okay? So again, we've learned that the rotation around a double bond is restricted. Um, trans isomers can't be interconverted just by rotation to the cis isomer, right? And so they are different molecules. However, the conformations of butane that are shown there, we can have rotation around that carbon-carbon single bond. And we can have different conformers, but they're all the same molecule, okay? This conformer, this conformer is not a different molecule than this conformer, okay? Because it's free rotation, it can rotate all the time. However, this molecule is clearly a different molecule than this. They have different boiling points and melting points and all sorts of things going on, okay? So, <clears throat> there are different classes of alkenes that you have to know. We have monosubstituted alkenes where the carbon-carbon double bond is only attached to one other carbon. This is an example of a monosubstituted alkene. The alkene is bound to only one other carbon atom. We can have disubstituted alkenes 
where the alkene is connected to two different carbon atoms. Okay, now here's this one. But notice I can also have it like they have on the board where the two carbon atoms are attached to the same carbon. It doesn't matter. Two R groups attached anywhere in the alkene are going to be called disubstituted. So I can have this where the two uh, methyl groups are both on this, on this carbon. I can have it where they're trans to one another, or I can have it to where they're cis to one another. So in this particular example, there are three different scenarios for a disubstituted alkene. That's disubstituted, that's disubstituted, and that's disubstituted. Okay? We can have a tri-substituted alkene where the alkene is attached to three different carbon groups and we can have tetra-substituted where the alkene is attached to four different carbon groups. So there's a tetra-substituted example. Okay? And we can have uh, some examples that you see uh, down there. Do you think these all will have the same types of properties? No. And it turns out that the more substituted the alkene, the more stable it is. Tetra-substituted alkenes are more stable than tri-substituted alkenes, are more stable than di-substituted alkenes, are more stable than mono-substituted alkenes. Okay? The chemistry of a tetra-substituted alkene is different. It's usually slower than the chemistry that might occur with a monosubstituted alkene. Okay. Can I do the same type of stuff? Yes. But the chemistry or the rate at which the reactions will occur is quite frequently vastly different. Okay? So, let's talk about naming alkenes. Naming alkenes is similar to naming alkanes, except the functional group is different. The rule in naming an alkane was to find the longest chain, right? And then you were going to find that parent, you were going to add A and E to the end of it to give you the name, right? So if it had six carbons, it was hexane, meaning that it was an alkane. If it has six carbons and a double bond, it's going to be a hexene. So for alkenes, you're going to add E and E as the ending to the parent. Okay, so here's an example. Here's a molecule. Well, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six carbon atoms in the longest continuous chain. And oh, by the way, for alkenes, the longest continuous chain must include the alkene. So if you have a longer chain another way, you got to go the way that includes the alkene, okay? So this is called one hexene. What does that number tell me? Why is this one hexene? It's the location of the double bond. It is the location of the double bond. Why didn't they call it two hexene? The double bond is between one and two. Yeah, we want the lowest number, right? So this is going to be one hexene. Now if I look here, I've got the longest chain of one, two, three, four, five. No, one, two, three, four, five, six. So now I've got a methyl substituted hexene. So I'm going to circle the parent, right? And again, we're going to number such that the lowest number it belongs to the alkene. So we're going to number from right to left. Alkene nomenclature gets a little more simple because you can identify easier where you start. Right, I could have started numbering here, and that would have given me one, two, three for my first point of branching as opposed to four, but we want to have the lowest number for our alkene. So this is 4-methyl-1-hexene. What does the four tell me? Where the methyl group is, what does the one tell me? Well, the double bond is, that's right. Here's another example. And again, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. See, I could have had six if I had counted this, right? 
That could have been the longest continuous chain, but it didn't contain the alkene. You want the longest chain that contains the alkene, and that's going to be what's numbered here. Right? So there's my parent chain. What are my two substituents? What's this one? That's a methyl. And what's this one? This one's an ethyl, right? So this is 2-ethyl, 3-methyl, 1-pentene. Similar kind of naming rules that you learned before, but you have to have that longest chain contain the alkene, and you want to have the alkene have the lowest possible number. Okay, so that's always important. Now, you're going to have to pay attention to cis and trans here, though. Here's an example of a molecule. These are diastereomers of one another. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, Five. No, they're not. These are these are different. I'm sorry. We could have done it the other way, though. Okay. So um, this is a, a, a different molecule. So we'll, we'll look at naming this one in just a moment uh, with its cis isomer. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six. That's the longest chain. No matter how I number it, one, two, three, or one, two, three, it's going to give me three hexene. And the two groups are on opposite sides, right? So there's my alkene. There's one R group. There's the other R group. They're on opposite sides. So this is trans-3-hexene. Here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is the longest chain. So this is going to be a pentene. And I'm going to number it this way because that gives me the 2-pentene. If I numbered it this way, it would be 1, 2, 3, right? You okay? Yes. Yeah. Good. And so I've got a methyl group here, and I've got a methyl group here. So this is cis 3, 4 dimethyl pentene. Okay? Because you've got a methyl group off of this, you've got a methyl group off of that, right? And but these groups are cis to one another, right? So what do I do? How do I know that this is cis? Right? You have to look at each carbon atom of the alkene, right? And then you look at the two groups. You see that the carbon group and the carbon group are on the same side. But that means that this and this are trans, right? So how do I know this isn't trans? What makes this cis? What's so special about this group? Because it's the longest continuous chain. It's part of the longest continuous chain, that's true. It's the higher priority group. Wait, what? How do we figure out the higher priority group? Right? And this is a carbon, and this is a carbon, right? What makes this one so special? It has more carbon. Right? So it takes higher priority. Okay? Yes? What uh, makes this uh, CH3 uh, at 0.1? so special uh, well, in compared terms to of hydrogen compared to three is it because we've highlighted it and this is what we're examining well it is because of what we're examining but okay. there is a rule and we're going to get to it okay okay but it has to do with priority so if you look at the two carbon atoms of the alkene So you can see it. All right. You look at each carbon of the alkene and you assign priorities. Okay, we'll talk about this in just a moment, but it's a good, good introduction. I've got, on this alkene, I've got a hydrogen and I've got a carbon. Which one of those has the highest atomic number? That's right. So this is going to be our low priority group. This is going to be our high priority group. So each carbon gets its own. Each carbon, we have to assign the groups a priority. So here I've got a carbon and a carbon. Can I make a decision? Not directly just by looking at that atom. But what else is attached to this carbon? Three hydrogens. And what else is attached to this carbon? Two carbons and a hydrogen. So which one do you think takes higher priority? The one with the more carbons, right? So this is going to be my high priority group. This is going to be my low priority group. And what you notice 
is that the two high priority groups are on the same side of that. That's how we know it's cis. Okay. You're right. This methyl group and this methyl group are trans to one another, but it's irrelevant in terms of the naming. Yes, ma'am. So how did you know to compare priorities from this side versus that side instead of because when we're talking about cis and trans, we're always talking about how they are with respect to this plane. So I have to know on this carbon what's high priority, and I have to know on this carbon what's high priority. Right, my question is why didn't you compare the two atoms on the top and the two on the bottom instead of left and right? Uh, we always go with the highest priority, and we look on each carbon. What one's high? That one. What one's high? That one. How are those two highs related to one another? Their system on that's how it is. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, as you can imagine, cis and trans can get really, really complicated because we were trying to figure out: well, is it cis to this, or is it cis to that, or trans to that? Right? It's not clear. Cis and trans is very unclear. It's ambiguous. It really only works well if you only have two R groups. It really only works well for uh, disubstituted alkenes. Now they just did it for this trisubstituted alkene. Yes, you can do it, but it's a lot more confusing. And so what a lot of people will use is what's called the E and Z configuration. Okay? E and Z configuration. You do the same thing. You look at the alkene and you assign priorities, just like we did here. You assign priorities. And then you ask yourself, are the highest priority groups on the same side or on opposite side? And here's a cheesy way to remember it. If the high priority groups are on the same side, Z, it is Z. Okay? It comes from the German, Zusammen, which means together. At least that's what they tell me. I can't speak German. Okay? But it works. Here, the higher priority groups are on opposite sides. We call that E. So this would be the E isomer. This would be the Z isomer. Let's look at some examples. Let's start off with something simple. So it's just a simple alkene. It's got two chlorines attached to it. What do I need to do to determine whether or not that is in the E or Z configuration? I'm going to assign priorities. I'm going to start with one of the carbons. I'm going to start on the left. I've got hydrogen and chlorine. Which one's the higher priority? Chlorine. Why is it the higher priority? Higher atomic number. On this carbon, I have chlorine and hydrogen. Again. So it's going to be high priority, low priority. The high priority groups are on what? So it is, this is an E alkene. So is E always trans and Z always cis? Well, it's, again, it's re re with respect to the highest groups. But yes, E will always have the groups on opposite sides. Let's look at one that might be a little more challenging for us. They're all halogens. Is that an E alkene or a Z alkene? What do I have to do? Use a periodic table. Got to use a periodic table, right? I made it kind of easy for us. We're only going to deal with the halogen family, right? And that goes fluorine, chlorine, chromine, iodine, and astatine. There's only been like 100 milligrams of astatine ever made, so I don't know why we put it up there. Right, but that's the order, right? So, which one's going to be the highest priority here? Chlorine, right? This is going to have a lower atomic number than this one. Remember, as we go down a family, the atomic number gets higher, right? 
I don't need to know exactly what the atomic number is. I just need to order them, right? So this is going to be my low priority group. This is going to be my high priority group. Here I have bromine and iodine. Which one's going to be my high priority group? Iodine's going to be high priority. Bromine's going to be low priority. So my high priority groups are on the same side. So we're going to call it Z. This is a Z alkene. Okay? Z or Zeta, whatever you want to call it. Okay? Z alkene. Okay? So you need to know how to name both cis and trans and E and Z. You need to know how to use them interchangeably. Okay? If I tell you which of, on an exam, which of the following is trans whatever, whatever, alkene, you need to be able to figure it out. If I tell you which of the following is the Z isomer of, the, of whatever, alkene, you need to be able to figure it out. Or I could give you a structure and say name it, right? So you need to be able to go both ways. So, I want, we just did some work. I want you all to get together in groups for about five minutes and I want you to work A, B, C, and D. I want you to figure out each, for each and every one of those, if they are E and Z, come on, pair together, work together. Share the struggle. You gotta be able to identify the properties on each carbon of the alkene, right?
you should be struggling with something right now. It's okay. It'll make it stick better when you figure it out. One more minute. Break away from our groups. Let's look at A. In order to determine whether or not something is E or Z, we have to look at both carbons of the alkene, right? Here are the two carbons that we need to look at. This carbon is attached to this group, and it is attached to this group. We have to determine priority. What's the higher priority? CH3 or CH2Cl? going to be higher priority, right? So we'd have high and we would have low. How about here? We've got CH3. Here we have CH2, CH3. The bottom is going to be the higher priority, right? So I've got high priority, high priority across. So that is, that is the E configuration, right? So, I don't know why I did that. So here we have E. Notice how they put the E. It's in parentheses. This is E, 1-chloro, 2-3-dimethyl, 2-pentene. Here's the longest chain. Right? And so I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's how we get the pentene. If I number here, it's 1, 2. If I number here, it's 1, 2, 3. So we're going to number this way. So it's 2 pentene, right? So 1 chloro, 2, 3 dimethyl, 2, 2 pentene, and it is of the E configuration, right? So we've got that one. Let's look at B. What is high, what is low? Pardon? And why? higher atomic number, right? So it's got the higher atomic number, then chlorine. Remember, it's fluorine, chlorine, bromine. Right, so high, low. And here I've got what's not drawn? There's a hydrogen there, right? So I've got a hydrogen and I've got a methyl group. What's going to take priority? Obviously the methyl group. So I've got bromine and methyl, which are the two highs on the same side. So it's going to be Z, right? There's my longest chain. So it is Z1-bromo, 1-chloro, one 1-propene. One that is the correct name for that particular alkene. Okay? Now let's look at C. This one is E. 2, 3, 4, trimethyl 3 heptene. We're going to find the longest chain. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Right? So we're going to circle that. That's going to be our parent. We've got three methyl groups hanging off of it, right? We're going to number this way, because that gives me the, the three for the alkene. If I numbered this way, it would happen at four. So our numbering system is going to be this way, right? So it's going to be a um, two, three, four, trimethyl, three hectene. But i got to figure out the configuration, right? So here, what's my group? I've got a methyl group and I've got a CH. Well, this is a CH with two carbons attached to it. This is just a carbon with three hydrogens. Which one takes the priority? This one. So this is high priority, right? What about here? This group is the higher priority group, right? This is the low priority group. So high, high are on opposite sides. So that is E, right? It is E. If you're feeling a little frustrated right now, it's normal. You have to practice this. It's rule application. 
And if you miss a rule, you can get into some trouble. Now, we're not going to name the last one because we haven't started talking about cyclohexyls being, or cyclo anything being a substituent. We haven't talked about those rules. Uh, so I don't want to do that. But we can still define whether or not it's E or Z. So let's do that. So here's my first carbon that I'm going to look at. I've got a CH and I've got a CH2. I've got a CH2, CH3, and this is a CH, CH2, CH2. Which one of these do you think takes priority? Top one. This is going to be the high priority. This is going to be the high priority. And those are on opposite side, so it would be a an E isomer. That's right. But we won't we won't uh, come up with the name quite yet. Okay. We'll learn more about that a little later on. What's the difference between an alkene and an alkyne? Alkynes are Y and E. They have triple bonds. A carbon-carbon triple bond consists of a sigma bond and two pi bonds. Right? That's what you see in your model kit. There's a pi bond in this plane, and there's a pi bond in that plane, and they are 90 degrees to one another. So you've got a pi bond here, you've got a pi bond there. But that makes this carbon-carbon and everything that's attached to it be linear, right? So they're not going to be bent like you might expect uh, them to be. They're going to be linear. So the uh, SP hybridized uh, carbon atoms are linear in shape. You've got 180 degrees as shown here, right? And these are a special class of molecule. They do very similar chem chemistry as alkenes. They usually just do it twice because they've got two pi bonds. We'll learn a little bit more about their chemistry in later chapters. Okay? So the functional group here is what? It's the triple bond. Okay, it's the two pi bonds. All right? So you have an alkene, which has a pi bond, and you have an alkyne, which has two pi bonds. Okay? So the alkyne will be a a functional group, the alkene will be a functional group. Okay, so you can look at it that way. Here's some examples of uh, simple alkynes that you might have come into contact with. So, if you've ever watched somebody weld with gas, oxyacetylene torch welding, acetylene is CHCH or C2H2, it is welding gas. Okay. Uh, usually combines with oxygen and an oxyacetylene torch to produce a really hot flame. You can use it to melt steel very, very easily. They use this to weld uh, railroad tracks, which is what they're showing here, or cutting a railroad track apart. So you can cut, you can weld, it gets real hot. Okay, So acetylene uh, works quite well for that. This is the simplest alkyne you can have. Put two white spheres on the end of this and you've got a set of them. Right? The two hydrogens, the two carbons. Okay? But there are other alkynes that you may be familiar with. Okay? So for example, the pill. There's an example of using an alkyne in female birth control. Okay, you'll see by looking at these molecules, ethyl. Estradiol is related to estradiol. Looks kind of the same in a lot of respects, except this one has a carbon-carbon triple bond here. No carbon-carbon triple bond in the natural version. Okay. Progesterone. Okay, here it is where we've got a carbon-carbon triple bond. Here it is where we don't have even an alcohol. We've got a ketone functional group out there. Okay, but these carbon-carbon triple bonds end up being very, very important medically. A lot of antifungal medicines that you might use if you get a fungal infection contain carbon-carbon triple bonds, okay? That functional group, it turns out, can kill fungi pretty easily, okay? Through a lot of mechanisms that I don't really understand anything about. But I know something about the alkyne, okay? Here's some other examples. Have you ever heard of the poisonous dart frog? Right, take a dart. Rub it on the, on the frog, throw it at your prey, right? It kills them. 
uh, or kills the prey, uh, or whatever it is that you're, you're hunting with, with a poison dart. Uh, this molecule you'll see is quite complicated, but what you'll see is you'll see carbon-carbon triple bonds. We also see other functional groups in this molecule. What else do we see? There's the alkynes. What else do we see? I see an alcohol. What else do I see? I don't see an amide, but I see something close to it. What else is it? This is an amine. Right? So I see an alcohol, I see an amine, I see some alkynes. What about here? Those are alkenes. What you start to see is nature starts to put a lot of different functional groups together to give the function of the, of the molecule. What do you think would happen to this molecule if we took some of this stuff off? Maybe we took the alcohol off, or maybe we took off one of these alkynes. Think it'd still be poisonous? Probably not. Might be. I'm not going to test it, though. Okay? But, I mean, you've got to have these functional groups around for this stuff to work. One of the things that you need to know about the alkyne, it is a special functional group in one respect. And that is... So just any carbon group out here, okay? That is special. That terminal alkyne, we call it a terminal alkyne because there, the alkyne starts at carbon number one. It only has a hydrogen here. These hydrogens are unusually acidic, okay? So if we think about acidity, how do we measure acidity again? We can measure pH, that's true, but pH depends on the concentration of the acid in water. But just for a molecule, what value do we use? We use P something else. PKA, right? It turns out that the PKA of methane is somewhere on the order of 50. That's a very high number. Does that mean it's acidic or not? Not acidic, right? The higher the number, the lower the acidity. Now, if I look at ethylene, these hydrogens have a pKa of around 43-ish. I don't remember the exact number. Is that more acidic or less acidic? That's more acidic by a little or a lot. It's actually a fair amount, but it's not to write home and, and have your mom put on the refrigerator as an award, right? It's not that great. But terminal alkynes have a pK of around 25. That's a huge drop. They are much, much more acidic than the other hydrocarbons. And the reason is what effect? What's changing on these carbons as we go down? What four effects did we learn about for acidity? Oh, that's a different chapter. Got to go back, right? We learned about the element effect. We're all the same element. Can't be that. It's the hybridization effect. This is what hybridization? SP3. This is what? SP2. And this is SP. This is the hybridization effect. These hydrogens are acidic. And we can take advantage of that. We can react them with bases to make these things that are called carbanions. And these are going to be very important. These things like to react and do things. And we can generate them by reacting these terminal alkynes with a strong base. Here we'll just use an NH2 minus, which is, has a pKa of about 35. So this has a pKa of about 35. It's a higher pKa than the alkyne. So is the reaction going to lie to the right or to the left? So stronger, stronger, weaker, weaker. Which way is it going to lie? Right. To the right. Remember, 
More stable means weaker, right? In terms of uh, acids and bases. Weaker acids, weaker bases are more stable. All right. So that's just an introduction of what we're going to be able to do with these types of things moving forward. All right, so remember the equilibrium always favors the weaker Lewis acid. Here's my weaker acid, there's my stronger acid, it's going to lie to the right. And in fact it lies so far to the right, it's got an equilibrium constant of 10 to the 13. This reverse arrow essentially doesn't exist. Technically it does, but it's so tiny that we can ignore it. Okay? Which is the nice thing I like about organic chemistry. When things get really tiny, I can ignore them. When they get really large, I can ignore them. Right? I'm only interested in the relative changes that occur. And when it's big or really, really tiny, usually it doesn't end up mattering too much. All right. We will finish that up on Thursday, those things. We've got a quiz for today. So I need you to turn in question 3.24, A through C, 3.24, A through C. Please turn them in on that table on your way out. I will see you Thursday. Do not forget to check your calendars for available times for outside of class review sessions. I also want to remind you that review sessions are not, I repeat, not a requirement for you. They are there to help you. Have a good rest of the day. I will try my best to record it, but again, it will be a camera sitting in one place, and so I can't promise you'll get the best. <laughs>